Welcome to NCBA's Cattleman's Call podcast with host Lane Nordland. Hello friends, Lane Nordland here. Time for another Cattleman's Call podcast. We're going to be talking about short term and long term in cattle nutrition here today. We're joined by Dr. Dusty Abney, a cow calf nutritionist with Cargill Animal Nutrition. And uh, Dr. Abney, you've been uh, been presenting at the Cattlemen's Colleges during the Cattle Industry Convention for for a few years, it sounds like. Yeah, for, for several in a row. You keep making a bad decision, and here I am, but uh, <laughs> either with one of my colleagues or by myself. And it's, it's always, when I was younger, it was a, a big dream to be able to speak at NCBA. And so really honored to get to do it. Still waiting on that, on that call for the, for the general session, but maybe one of these days. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll introduce you maybe when you okay, do that. We'll right. make that an agreement. I'll, I'll come out and re- read, read about a two page intro and then you can come out and it's all about who, you know, right? I, I think so. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to, talk to somebody there, but <laughs> <laughs> Hey, but uh, obviously this conversation's happening during, uh, the, uh, CattleCon 2024 in Orlando, Florida. And, uh, uh, a record number of, of folks attending Cattlemen's College this year. Can, can you just share more about uh, about your background, where you grew up, and, and uh, what, what put you on the path uh, that you're on here today? Sure. So I grew up in East Texas. Uh, I live southeast of Dallas, about an hour and a half, in a little town called Athens. Uh, that's where I'm from. That's where my wife is from. Uh, and in spite of the fact that we didn't meet until we were in junior college, we knew probably 10 people in, in common. It's just that kind of a community down yeah. there. Uh, grew up on mostly a horse operation, uh, and then my mom remarried, uh, and that gentleman was in the cattle, and, and they had a feed store together, and I worked in that feed store for several years, uh, driving a fertilizer truck, mixing feed, delivering feed, that kind of thing, and that, he had a little bit of a background in nutrition, uh, but nutrition began to intrigue me, and one of my, you know, as a lot of kids do, I was influenced heavily by a really good 4-H extension agent. And uh, he encouraged me to, I was going to go get a master's, get a master's in uh, uh, range management, I think is what he encouraged me to do. And he said, you ought to look at Texas Tech. Most kids in my part of the world end up at A&M, but uh, Tech was a better fit for me, it seemed like, and it was further away from home. So I didn't have to go home on the weekends and patch fence or chase cows or work at the feed store. So it wasn't too bad. And uh, started at Texas Tech, did a bachelor's there, was actually the mask rider at Tech. Uh, Way back when we won't I, say the I year. was a mascot in college too. Well, Lane, I, I know it's different, but I I wore I, I wore a costume. Right so. to me, a mascot somebody's got a big foam head on. That, that was me. I I joked that I was the symbol of the university. That sounds kind of grandiose, but uh, oh, I'll accept that. But answer. I did wear a cape and a and a mask, and the cape had some sequins <laughs> on it. But uh, that was a really fun opportunity, and and allowed me to further publish yeah. or polish my public speaking skills. Um, had planned on a master's did a master's and then had an opportunity to do a doctorate and uh i thought well we came this far we just as well get it done so i, I did what you're not supposed to do i got all three of my degrees from your lime bread yeah, well, I, well yeah that's a nice way to put it uh obviously it's, it's you've had some experience opinion. in some yeah, of the yeah. in some of the <laughs> free associations but uh, but yeah i i joked that i was from east texas so i was maybe a little inbred before but then <laughs> my education is triple inbred when it gets right down to it but it was just so wonderful. They just wouldn't let me leave. That's what I choose to believe. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it was it was a kind of a long process. Uh, if anybody's got a kid that's maybe not headed down the right path, you know, it took a short nine years to finish my bachelor's degree, and then the rest of it was only about four or five years. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm hypothetically thoroughly educated. <laughs> it doesn't always show, but somebody worked hard to get me there. Well, uh, I, I just uh, to clue our listeners in, I was uh, the champ, the mascot at Man- Montana State University oh, wow. for 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 a stint there. So that's good. School. We got Vim. You and I got Vim for our schools. Vim. Vim. Is that like Vim Vigor and Vitality? Exactly. Or? Okay. It's part of our fight song. So <laughs> don't ask me to recite ours. I I just wanted to ride the horse. I had to read the fight song off the scoreboard. So. So uh, uh, let's talk about your role at Cargill. How, how long have you uh, uh, worked on, on in the nutrition field with Cargill? Uh, been uh, in the nutrition field for a total of uh, 19 years. Just finished my 17th year with Cargill. They continue to make bad decisions like NCBA does. They keep me around. <laughs> and uh, they've been a really good company to work for. Uh, probably my favorite thing about my job is how diverse it is. So uh, I do a lot of cow-calf work, a lot of pasture work, stalkers, that sort of thing. I also get to play with feedlot. 
Uh, one new initiative that I'm working on now is uh, what we're calling our upgrade program, and that's where we're working the beef team with our dairy team, which is a very strong group of individuals, working to find ways to better feed these dairy cross calves mm-hmm. that are coming into the market. Uh, and so learned a lot there. We've still got a huge amount to learn and, and some really good hills to climb there. And so some really interesting challenges coming up and, and excited about that. So uh, I get to do a lot of public speaking. I get to see a lot of different things. I, I am I try to be the eternal student. Uh, so when I come to your place, I'm probably there to sell you something, but I'm probably going to ask you a million questions and try to learn something from you while I'm there. Um, so getting to go to South Dakota in late February this year is probably not something I'm maybe terribly excited about. If you can find a way to bet on a blizzard <laughs> in Vegas, uh, there's going to be a blizzard that week. There's just no way it's not going to. But I know that while I'm there, I'm going to learn some things I didn't know before, mm-hmm. other than I shouldn't go to South Dakota the last week in February. <laughs> so it's well, it's a great job and, and uh, got a great group of people that I work with. We've got a, a nice tech team that's that's really well-rounded and – and the best thing is that when I tell people I don't know, which I'm really good at, uh, I can go back and, and I have a, a good depth of people that I can I can pose that question to, and we will find the answer. Now, uh, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the the areas uh, of the cattle industry are, are so diverse, as you mentioned, from uh, cow-calf to, to, to backgrounders to feedlots that, that you work with. And uh, I, I think uh, the next few years are going to be very telling in, uh, in the management of herds and, and producers' decisions. And, of course, I'm, I'm, and my, our listeners know this, is I, I'm way more uh, knowledgeable about the cow-calf sector, uh, being from Montana and that, that being my background. But uh, between all the droughts that we've had um, and uh, now having more grass than we knew what to do with this year, uh, we saw a lot of issues, and I think we're going to see a lot of issues pop up uh, in the next few years just based off of drought's impact on cattle health and nutrition and management decisions on that front. Uh, so, so I'm curious about that, but what, 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 what is your focus of your uh, Cattlemen's College uh, co- um, presentation here this year? And, and maybe that can tie into con- some, some of my concerns as well when we're looking at how the decision today could, could impact your herd for years to come and, and the transition of your ranch to the next generation possibly as well. Sure. If it's not a profitable enterprise, short of uh, having some oil wells or being a tech billionaire, it's going to be really difficult to transfer it to the next generation. So one of the reasons I am so focused on profitability is that exact reason, because I want people to be able to pass this on. Because it's it's not, you have to kind of be born into this thing to to really love it and understand it. There's folks that's not, but the greatest majority of us came from it. Uh, and as we get more efficient and as urban sprawl gets worse, uh, there's going to be fewer and fewer of us. It's just kind of the way of the world. It's the trend we've been seeing since the 1800s. I don't expect that to stop anytime soon. So uh, being able to, to keep people profitable, allow them not only to stay in the business, but hopefully to grow as well, is really important to me. Um, the, the old curse, may you live in interesting times, <laughs> things, I'm not sure how much more interesting I can stand for things to get. Uh, but nobody really asked my opinion on that when, when those decisions are made. So uh, we've got to be ready for these challenges as they come. You know, the old days of of having 20 cows and or pick your number and, you know, they just make money just because they're cows, I think those are over. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to have to be way more focused on the decisions we make and and really have a plan. And that's, that's one thing. Um, I joke that it gets pretty Baptist when I give a presentation, and it's going to get pretty Baptist tomorrow when I give it. Um, the, the, the topic is, is uh, short-term decisions with long-term consequences because I see people do things that I know and 99% sure they know are not the right decisions, but they justify themselves into it. So I'm going to spend about 45 minutes or a little longer tomorrow explaining to people what the consequences of those actions may be, and, and those actions can echo down for – literal decades uh, just via fetal developmental programming profitability all those things can can really come together in a way that can help you or they can really hurt you consequences can be good or bad and we get to pick which direction we think we want to go and one thing I'm really careful to tell people is that no decision is still a decision Um, I personally suffer from a, a disease called analysis paralysis 
Uh, when my wife wants me to do something and I really don't want to do it, I, I ask for more data. Um, and, and I think some people do that consciously, and I think a lot more people do it unconsciously. Uh, they want to make the best decision possible, and I am all for that. But eventually you've got to make a decision. And if you don't, the decision will be made for you. I would much rather them have agency and be an active participant in that decision-making process uh, and, and be able to reap the benefits of their good decision than, than otherwise. You know, there's there's just so much data out there now. There there's so many great studies that have been done you know, on on the nutrition front, and so there's so many more options. I guess is what I'm trying to say in in, in putting herd health and nutrition all in the same boat in, in conversation as it should be. But so in, in today's world, obviously uh, input costs are, are top of mind too. But that factored in. What what are some of those other factors that are truly influencing producers' decision making? on the animal nutrition front here in 2024 and, and, and looking ahead here for the next few years, sure. in, in your opinion. And cost is cost is always going to be there. Uh, cost is one of the parts of my job is convincing people that what I'm asking you to do is the right thing, and here's the proof, and here's what I think the return on investment will be, here's the data, et cetera. Um, you can't discount cost, but cost cannot be the only thing you look at. You also have to look at cost the right way. So, you know, if we're looking at protein supplementation, a lot of people just want to look at dollars per ton. For instance, if they're going to look to buy some range cubes. Okay, well, that's a good starting spot, but what are you getting out of those dollars per ton? Um, So I like to talk about value a lot, which is not a new concept in our business, but I think people hear it as a sales pitch, and it's not. I I want people to make the best decision they can possibly make. So um, I may ask them to spend, for instance, if they've got decent quality forage, they've got less late or uh, mid-gestation cows, there's not a lot of energy demand on those animals, uh, and they just need some protein, then if you're in the market for some range cubes, I may ask you to look at a 38% range cube instead Mm -hmm. of a 20% range cube because it fits your operation better. Well, that's $100 more a ton, which it's not now. Who knows what it is now? Okay, well, that's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to help you understand on a cost per head per day basis, on a return on investment basis, this is your best decision to make. Um, So, that, that cost part cannot come out of it. I think the one that's really coming to the fore in the last few years, especially post-COVID, and is not going to get any better is labor. Mm-hmm. Uh, labor is such a huge aspect. Our, our operations are so labor intensive. Uh, and there's not really a good way on the cow-calf sector to automate a lot of that. You know, we're going to see, I think, in the feedlot sector, uh, we're going to see a lot more automation very quickly. Uh, the dairies are already seeing it. If you go to the trade show, there's at least one feeding robot on the floor down there right now. Uh, and I think autonomous trucks for feed delivery, for feed mixing, um, I think those are, are way closer than a lot of other people think. But we just don't have those luxuries in the cow-calf sector, uh, at least not on the scale of operation that a lot of people operate on. You know what? A huge percent of our, our, of our calves that go into the feed yards come out of operations that are less than 100 head. Mm-hmm. And that's great. It allows a lot more people to participate in the market. uh, But economy of scale is not your friend at that level. So you've got to really look and understand what's your time worth. Uh, When we look at convenience products, for instance, like a tub or a block, uh, our Ranger Limiter product, for instance, that allows you to feed cattle out on pasture without having to actually pour something out of a bag, those kind of products are generally more expensive. Uh, because there's research and development involved. Of course, there's marketing funds involved and that sort of thing. We would like to make a profit. We're just that kind of corporation that, you know, they'd like to continue to pay me. I'd like to continue to get a paycheck. So, uh, but we like to look at those things and determine, okay, well, this does return a good return on investment. This is a good financial decision for you for these reasons. And most of the people I work with, all the people that I know of that I work with, will tell you, okay, well, that's not a good fit for you, and here's why. Um, so I think looking at labor, looking at convenience, what are those things worth to you and your time, which cow-calf people are, I love y'all, but you are terrible about <laughs> looking at things on a basis of what's your time worth. Uh-huh. And not just from a dollars per hour standpoint, but I like to think of it from an opportunity cost standpoint. What, what else could you be doing with that time? you know, that you're out there, whether it's hand feeding or, or whatever it may be. I, I give people a hard time all, uh, pretty regularly who in the crowd keeps records, and I'll get half the crowd raise their hands. And then I'll say, keep your hands up. 
who's used those records in the last two years to make a decision? And the number of people that put their hands down is pretty astonishing. Mm -hmm. And I've, I, again, I can be a little bit, a little bit blunt up there, and I said, I'll say if you're not using those records to to make a decision, you're wasting your time. You could go fishing and have a better use of your time than doing that. It's not that I don't people to make, to keep records. I want them to utilize the data they've collected. Yeah. I want to make sure that the time and effort that you're putting into those cows is going to produce your return. So I think we're going to have to be more open to looking for help. And that's that's tough. It's really hard to admit I need help. It's hard for me. You know, I told you earlier that if I don't really answer, I'll go and, and talk to the rest of the people on my tech team and find somebody who does. Mm -hmm. That's not fun to admit you know, I've got all those letters after my name. I'm supposed to know everything, but we don't. None of us do. Uh, and and I like to joke that that in Rio Bravo, John Wayne asked Ricky Martin and and uh, Ricky, uh, which, which Ricky is that? Ricky Nelson and yeah. Dean Martin yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. Walter Brennan and Ward Bond. All those guys pitched in to help John Wayne. If John Wayne can ask for help, I guarantee you can suck it up and ask for some help. <laughs> Whether that be through extension or or uh, a nutritionist that works for a feed company like I do. Uh, there are, I mean, you go down, look at that trade show today and, and look at how many people are down there. Do they want to be paid for their time? Certainly. And they deserve to be paid for their time. Um, but we've got to be more open to expenditures like that on ranches to get a better return on investment overall. When, when you're working w with, uh, with a customer one-on-one -on -one or in a presentation, that's a cattleman's college, or it could be <laughs> down at the local, uh, uh, stockyards or, 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 for example, what what are some of the best engaging conversations you have with producers uh, on the topic of nutrition and trying to, you know, take that information that that people may be keeping and, and better use it for themselves? And uh, what what management systems or recommendations do, uh, do you suggest for them or, or maybe show them towards? Because there there's a lot of new ways that you can uh, keep track keep track of those records to help you with those decisions. Uh, could could you share some examples? Certainly, and, and people, you can drown in data. Oh, I, I, I understand that. <laughs> Very easily. So, you know, when people are, they ask me, which software system should I look at? You know, it's the one that you'll actually use. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of people get excited about a system. They, they pay the subscription fee or whatever it is, and then they try it for a month or two. The data entry part maybe is a little bit daunting to them. Uh, there's not a kid or a grandkid there to help them run mm -hmm. the system, and, and it just kind of falls out of use. Uh, that's kind of heartbreaking to me because you invested money in it, you were excited about it, and then you got distracted. So I think carrying through with a plan like that is a big deal. I, I tell people way too often, I'm, I want you to make a plan so that you can deviate from that plan. And that sounds a little counterintuitive, but what I'm saying there is the people that have the best deviations plan those deviations before they showed up. So you mentioned drought earlier. Um, we are one day closer to the next drought. It's going to happen. All the information from weather people that I trust that I've seen in the last couple of months has said that La Nina is making a comeback. El Nino didn't hang out very long, not nearly as long as we might have liked for him to. It's going to be dry in the summer again this year. Um, I think one thing I get kind of frustrated with my people about and I do think they're my people, is that we kind of wait and see. Well, the one more week mentality, especially when we're in the middle of a drought, but when a drought's developing and we know a drought's developing, I, I have people trying to pray a hurricane on shore so they can get a rainfall. Now, my customers that live on the coast really don't appreciate that kind of thing. <laughs> they're all for you getting two inches of rain, but they don't want to get 60 inches of rain in the process. Yeah. So um, I think we've got to admit that there's going to be a challenging situation coming. And, and change is just the new normal, whether that's markets, whether that's weather, whatever that may be, labor, whatever, technology, we are just in a world of change. And we've got to admit that. We've got to come to terms with that, and we've got to find a way to deal with it. Burying your head in the sand means that in five to ten years, Short of you having a really good job in town and a very understanding spouse that likes what you do on the weekends, if you're a weekend cow-calf guy, mm -hmm. you're not going to be in this game. Just not. And we need you in it. Yep. We need 
smaller, medium-sized, big producers. We need everybody. When you look at what beef demand's doing and how strong it is, and you look at how much the American people love beef and how, how valuable American beef is around the world, we need every cow that's out there. That's one of the reasons I've been working with the dairy beef producers is to fill the gap of the cow numbers that we've lost from drought. You know, our herd's the smallest it's been since the mid-'70s, if I remember right. So, uh, And we're still managing to produce more beef than we ever have. Mm -hmm. Those efficiencies, those technologies, uh, those management decisions that our customers are making, people are way better than they used to be, and I need to give them some credit because I spend a lot of time up there pounding on the pulpit and telling them they're all going to hell if they don't change their ways. <laughs> but we've got to continue to improve. We cannot, We can't just rest on our laurels. It's got to be continuous improvement you got to plan for that too you got to plan to come to things like ncba because otherwise how are you going to learn about this stuff you got to go to your local county extension meeting you got to join your local uh cattlemen's association to continue to bring in speakers like me and and be exposed to these ideas you've got to if you buy feed at a feed store you got to ask that guy hey what what's new that's out there that i need to know about and when somebody like me makes a recommendation to you, I'm not telling you that just because somebody's got letters after their name that you should automatically do what they say, but you should at least consider it. You know, I, I will ask people, I've stopped because I didn't like the answers I was getting, but I ask people, do you have an open mind about what I'm going to talk to you about? Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're really open to try almost anything. And people are shifting in their seats as you're talking. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and I'll, you know, I'll say, well, I'd like you to do X, Y, and Z. Oh, God, no, we can't do that. <laughs> and it's not even considered. Yeah. You know, my first slide... Uh, my marketing coordinator jokingly put it in my slide deck and it's called Dusty's Disclaimer. And, and it, the, the first bullet point is that I'm a, a uh, purveyor of professional discomfort. And, and it is my job to push you off balance and make you uncomfortable. So those people that, cause it can be intimidating when you're sitting in, in, in an audience and you have a presenter on stage and, and people sometimes may not ask the question that they, they really want to ask, mm -hmm. but you know, for the people that uh, maybe have, have that open mind or, or don't, don't feel that they're going to be embarrassed by asking a question. What, what are some of the most common questions that you do receive, whether that is when you're up at the pulpit <laughs> or maybe after the meeting, uh, you know, when someone feels more comfortable talking one-on-one -on -one with you, what are some of those just basic questions you get asked that truly can help shape the future of their cattle herd. Well, if I've shown some data, you know, I'll, I'll get people saying, well, do you think that's real? Mm -hmm. um, which I wouldn't put it up on the screen. I mean, it's not my data. It's somebody else's that I found in the literature somewhere. Uh, but I wouldn't show it if I didn't think that it was real. Uh, I also have people ask me, well, well, that's a university trial. But, you know, that's, I don't work at a university. My, my operation's far from that kind of exact. And even if you can't measure it, if you don't have the ability. So, for instance, one of the things I think you can do that's one of the best return on investment that's not even really nutritionally based, buy a set of scales. Or go on with your neighbor and buy a set of scales on shares. Because if you can't weigh your calves, how are you going to know what's happening? Um, but your inability to measure something does not mean that it didn't work. It just means that you didn't have uh, the technology to dig down granularly and see if it worked or not. And not everything works all the time. You know, we're, we work in a system of probabilities. And I'd love to tell you that if, if you out there and supplement a half pound of protein on this particular pasture during this particular period, here's exactly what you can see. But it's a biological system, and it's hugely complicated. So my, my tech brethren that do nothing but feedlot, I give them a hard time about how, how easy their job is <laughs> because all those animals are locked in a pen, and yeah. you control pretty much everything that happens except for the weather. It's not really that way in a cow calf operation. You know, we've got we've got weather to deal with as well, but then we have other things. You know, that animal is selecting what they're going to eat. Um, so those are big challenges that we have to meet, and we've got to decide. You know, we're still going to do these things that are positive, even though we may not directly see. Oh, look, there's 15 pounds of weaning weight. Now, if you keep good records and you've got a good set of scales, and and all that is on path then yeah you're going to see those things and what made me most frustrating is if you've got a lot of ground to make up the what i heard a, another nutritionist call one time the slower rabbits are easy to catch and they're very gratifying but there's not very many of them um, once you get way better it's kind of like when you're in school really easy to make a d or an f i'm living proof of that i mean it's <laughs> it's not hard at all c you know you could just put a little effort into it pull a c no problem a b 
you got to work a little harder for a B. You know, you got to put in some time. But if you want to make an A, man, you better buckle down and do some studying and, and do some of the homework. And that's what I ask my customers to do is, is let's make a commitment that you're going to get better at what you do. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you with the, some of the stuff that, that you don't know how to do and, and shouldn't know how to do. Um, that's why they pay me the medium bucks. But you've got to let me – this is going to sound a little rude. You've got to get the hell out of my way so I can come help you. <laughs> and that's, that's one of my biggest struggles is just to get people to, to be, as I said earlier, open to, to some of the things that I have to say. And not necessarily even with me on their place, you know, just here at Cattleman's College. I'm going to show you some data tomorrow that, that if you step back and think about it, it's not – rocket surgery this is not really off the wall stuff but i'm going to show it to you in such a way that it's going to make sense why it's good for everybody in the supply chain why it's good for you on your place from a winning weight perspective why it's good for the kill plant why it's good for uh, the guy at the grocery store and especially why it's good for the american consumer that wants the safest highest quality protein that they can get their hands on in their mouth around and when you're having these raw and blunt conversations with producers, I guess, what types of decisions are, are they making that truly are having a negative impact on their herd that you see the most? You know, one of the things we're going to talk about pretty extensively tomorrow is what does it matter if you skip a few days, whether it be protein supplementation or whether it's mineral supplementation? Um, you know, I've got a trial I'm going to show the results of. Again, not my trial, just some of the literature where they only – looked at the effects of trace minerals not not calcium and phosphorus and sulfur and magnesium and potassium they're looking at just copper and cobalt and and those kind of things no vitamins they're just looking at the differences and i mean we're talking about things that that we supply to cattle in the hundreds of milligrams per head per day range tiny tiny amounts but those authors saw a weaning weight difference well over 10 pounds on calves that really weren't weaned at a big big weight, those calves were only weaned at five months, if I remember those data correctly. So um, they're not huge calves. They're calves that weigh 450 or so. But a 10-pound weaning weight difference, and all they did was supplement trace minerals. All they did different, excuse me, was supplement trace minerals in the last third of gestation. Hmm. Not for the whole year. What? And I'm not sitting here telling you that suddenly calves are going to gain 50 more pounds if we supplement mineral for the entire year. But <laughs> yeah. to look at a study like that, I think it's pretty undeniable that that not only should we have mineral out there all the time, but there is a definite, not just a perceived value, but a definite hard value. I give people a hard time that, um, you know, a lot of people feed mineral religiously. They put a bag out at Christmas and a bag out at Easter every year. <laughs> and and that's while that's better than nothing— Okay, it's better than a brown and yellow salt block, which is not a comprehensive mineral program. It's not what you should be doing for your cattle. And I, I struggle not to say the best thing you should do for your cattle because a lot of people talk about, well, I, I don't want to make welfare cows. That's, look, you locked them into that pasture. You bought them. You put them in that pasture. Hopefully you keep your fences up. Your neighbors will appreciate it if you do. You are now responsible for what they eat. And, and one of the big, I've, I've done a, a talk with uh, Wesley Moore, one of my colleagues at Cargill, and, and uh, a few years ago called Nutrition Myths. It was kind of a Mythbusters thing, but we didn't want to get sued. And uh, <laughs> one of the things I talked about was that, uh, you know, cattle don't know what they should eat. There's this huge purveying thing that there's what we call nutritional wisdom. And every land-grant university in the United States from about 67 to about 77 did a trial on that. And what they found was that cattle kind of knew how much phosphorus they needed and they kind of knew how much salt they needed. They have no idea how much copper they need mm -hmm. or manganese or vitamin E or whatever. So by not providing those things to them, especially on some of the pastures that we have where we haven't fertilized in the last few years, uh, you know, to speak of, uh, and even with those, even with fertilization, those micronutrients are really difficult to get. When we skip those things, when we tell ourselves at the feed store, well, that bag of minerals, $25, $30, that's, I just can't afford that. Well, I will strongly disagree with you. And I'm married to a redheaded woman. I can strongly disagree with somebody. <laughs> I'm well practiced at it. Um, I'm also pretty used to losing. But <laughs> by not spending that money, by, by deciding that, that you are going to, 
effectively cheap your way out of that situation, there will be consequences. And that's what I hope to show people tomorrow is just what can those consequences look like. And it's not just this calf crop, uh, the call it what you want to, epigenetics, fetal programming, developmental programming, uh, probably the hottest topic in nutrition in the last 15 or 20 years. Basically what happens to the cow while she is gestating the calf will have lifelong implications for the calf. It up and down regulates genes uh, in that animal for its entire lifetime. It is literally programming that animal how it's going to perform. Uh, and on the steer side, you see differences in hot carcass weight, differences in the percent of cattle at grade choice, weaning weight, uh, morbidity, all that kind of stuff. On heifers, though, on heifers, you see major differences on, on reproductive ability. Yep. And you see big differences on the number of heifers that get bred. You see big differences on heifers that are uh, having calves in the first 21 days. And there's actually more data than that that's not really fetal programming data but data that says that heifers that calve in the first 21 days, you're about twice as likely to keep those heifers in your herd over a longer period of time, and they wean more weight of calves. So when I say that the decisions you make today will affect you for decades to come, I'm not being facetious about that. I'm not being my normal smart aleck self. I am 120% serious that that's exactly what we're doing. When we decide that, that mineral's too expensive or you know, I can't really afford to feed these cows protein, whatever it may be, um, we're really going to hurt ourselves. And just because you fed those cows three range cubes a week, whether they needed it or not, in your mind, that's not what I'm yeah. talking about. I'm talking about actually meeting their nutritional requirements. How do you know what those are? You probably need to talk to somebody like yeah. me or extension, somebody that, that knows more about the topic than you do. you got to be vulnerable and you got to be like John Wayne and Real Bravo and you got to go to, to, Ricky Nelson and Dean Martin and Walter Brennan say, hey, I need some help. Yep. Yep. And it's important, you know, you, you mentioned the welfare cow statement and whatnot, but uh, uh, they're, they're really not welfare cows anymore when, uh, when they're open, uh, preg check. And uh, uh, a lot of producers saw that because of uh, a lot of different factors, but I think nutrition was one of the top things that a lot of folks maybe pushed aside in our drought-stricken lands and uh, – yeah, it's weird to get a twelve, thirteen hundred dollar uh, open cow going through the ring because that's what they're bringing. It, it seems in some of these markets, but it's a whole lot more expensive to replace them right now too. Oh, it's huge, and that's why I want to focus on heifers, just because you know it's been really difficult. The general number I always hear is that you'd like to keep ten percent of your heifers every year just to keep up with to keep your herd the same size, much less to grow your herd. And with the calf prices we've had, which thank goodness the calf prices have been really good, the feeder calf prices have. Um, you know, it's really difficult to justify keeping those heifers back. And that's a decision you have to make on your own. You've got to figure out, okay, well, what's, what's the value of this animal to me over the coming years? But um, that coupled with the fact, you know, let's say we do keep some heifers out of some of these drought herds. Um, think about what the implications of that are. If we shorted her mama while that heifer was being gestated, and then we short the heifer while she's an adult animal, that cycle is going to really continue to not pay us dividends for the foreseeable future and far into the foreseeable future. You talked about what we want to pass down to our kids. Um, it's going to be really difficult to pass a herd down to them, but what's the herd you're going to pass down to them? Yeah. Because, you know, at one point I really want to get in people's heads about this fetal programming, developmental programming thing is if you have really good genetics that you worked hard on, and a lot of people really focus on genetics, and I think that's awesome. That's how we make a lot of progress in this industry. Um, those better genetics require better nutrition. We don't just have a calf that's heavier at weaning and a calf that, that is, has a higher hot carcass weight and, and marbles better. That doesn't just fall out of the sky. Um, that has got to go into that animal's mouth. So we've got to make sure that we're making those decisions. But beyond that, the fetal programming piece means it doesn't matter how good the genetics are. They still get downregulated when that animal, when the dam that gestates that animal is not being fed and managed appropriately. And it will come back to bite us in places we won't like. Well, again, very, very, like I said, it's raw. It can be emotional. Uh, oh, these it decisions, most definitely is. Especially when you're having a conversation with a producer that's made his entire life uh, out on a, on an operation. But uh, Dr. Abney, I, I guess for our, our friends that are listening to this that maybe 
would like to attend one of your presentations, get in touch with you, or maybe maybe someone else uh, at Cargill or, or just their nutritionists in general. I, uh, what, what are some last tips or just final comments you want to share with folks here today? You know, something that people just don't do often enough is is just ask about what's new or what the latest data is or uh, if you really want to be uncomfortable, but you really want to make a lot of a lot of progress quickly, ask somebody to come out to your place and look at what you're doing. Um, man, that is not easy. That is not easy at all. Uh, it's it's like any skill, and this is a skill set that we're trying to develop. Uh, to to go show somebody exactly what you're doing, it it doesn't get much more vulnerable than that. And then in that process, you've got to be open to listening to what they're talking about and not react defensively. Now, there are reasons people do things, uh, but it's very easy for a reason to become an excuse. So you got to be honest with yourself about which it is, uh, and especially in a drought situation or a stress situation, labor, whatever it may be in this post-COVID world, you know, we're, we're going to have more and more challenges. So we've got to be ready to respond to those in a way that's, that's going to be uh, meaningful in our operation, but more than anything else, it's got to be profitable for us. And that's, that's what I care about. And how can folks uh, maybe get in touch with you or, or find, find out more about you? Uh, well, uh, Lord help them if that's what they want. But <laughs> uh, my email address is dusty underscore abney at cargill.com. Be happy to, to visit with anybody there. And, and if I'm not our nutritionist in your area, I can certainly put you in contact with who is. Uh, but we can, we'd love to help you given the opportunity. Well, I really appreciate you joining us here today at uh, CattleCon, and uh, uh, wish you luck there tomorrow, intimidating those people there from the pulpit at they uh, can Cattleman's be. College. They can be, but yeah. I, I, I've handled You're them before. You're a friend, though. You're yeah. a friend, though. I'm trying to be, <laughs> if they'll let me. Well, we appreciate your insight, and, and uh, we're, we're glad to have you back here at CattleCon for Cattleman's College. It's always my pleasure. Well, again, Dr. Dusty Abney joining us here today with Cargill Animal Nutrition. I hope that uh, was an enlightening conversation for everybody here today, and uh, we're going to continue to have more chats just like this and all things here on the Cattleman's Call podcast. Uh, Dr. Adney, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Well, friends, thanks for answering the Cattleman's Call here today. I'm Lane Northland. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in to NCBA's Cattleman's Call podcast with Lane Nordland. For more information, visit ncba.org and make sure to subscribe to the podcast today.